All right, folks. So here we are for the uh, January Q&A, first Q&A of 2022. Hope you guys are all well. Let's get on with your questions. These are questions from YouTube and Instagram. If you want to ask me questions, there is a Q&A every month. Moments a pretty good frequency, and it's usually about three videos. I try and get through as much as I can in half an hour, and then it goes on to the next video. So let's settle in. And um, before I sort of crack on, if you would like to work with me uh, on your own strength and physique goals, if you have some goals for 2022, fat loss goals, some muscle gaining goals, you want to get from beginner to intermediate to advanced in strength, hit me up. There's a link in the description. At least send me an email. Let's talk. Let's see what I could do for you. And uh, we'll take it from there. So we're going to start with questions from YouTube. And this is a question from one of the regulars of the, uh, of the channel, which is Bruno. Bruno Suarez Rodriguez says, a really good question. He said, Faz, as of now, I squat pull and front squat weekly, but that hasn't been sufficient to develop my glutes to a point where they look harmonious to the rest of my physique. Would you recommend direct glute work or just put my head down and get stronger in these and eventually it'll catch up? It's a really good question. Now, it's a good question for a number of reasons. Firstly, because there's so many avenues we can go down on this. Um, so, there's a whole idea of sort of weak points and what we can do about them. Also, the significance of weak points in compound exercises. So right now, he's squatting, he's deadlifting, and he's front squatting. Okay. Now, he feels that his glutes aren't quite caught up with the rest of his physique. Firstly, let's just tackle that. Tackle it visually. So firstly, we need to be sure that your glutes are actually lagging. Okay. It's not just something you see in yourself. Now, some people, they have uh, relatively long limbs and their glutes don't look as large. They're just inserted really high. Now, those type of people tend to be quite athletic. You know, they tend to be able to run fast, sprint, jump, all that kind of stuff. But visually, the glutes are never going to be huge. They're never going to be, you know, really big, as if they were inserted a lot lower. Like uh, for bodybuilding fans, you know, one of the things that Ronnie Coleman was always famous for was just huge striated glutes. But his glutes connected halfway down his leg, you know. Whereas a lot of people, they have longer limbs and their legs don't connect. Their glutes connect a lot higher. So they're never visually going to be have you know really outstanding glutes. So that might be one possibility. Now, let's take a look at the other possibility. Are we looking to add extra glute work in or is there another strategy? So what I would do is with Bruno, if I was working with him, I would want to look at his lifts and see what's missing. Now, occasionally I've come across someone who did have weak glutes and instead of adding in work specific to the glutes, we look at the form first of all, and then look at what's missing. Because oftentimes you can see things missing in the form. Like a common one is when they deadlift, they don't lock out all the way. So if you're deadlifting and um, you pull up and you kind of stop short of coming right the way up, that usually indicates um, potentially a glute weakness, which you might want to explore a bit more. It's one sign anyway, just from what I've seen. And right at the top, the glutes are responsible for driving the hips through and completing the lift. So um, if you're consistently not locking out, it probably means you're just not getting the glutes involved right at the top, which may mean over time they get weaker, or you may not be getting the glutes involved because they're not that strong and it's just too much effort to do. So... Something to think about, you know, there are form things as well. Let's take another one. Let's say if you're, when you're squatting, um, you're very much sort of on your toes and you're a very quad dominant squatter. That's another one, you know, you might be a very quad dominant squatter. You might just have very, very big quads, good quads relative to the rest of you. And if that's the case, well, it means your glutes just aren't working that much when it comes to the squat. Your body is shifting form so that your glutes don't have to get that involved. I mean, that's a really common one that I see. Guys will squat and um, they'll come up on their knees. You'll see their heels raise up off the floor and ever so slightly. And you'll see that. So you just know that the focus is all on the quads, all on the knees. That means they're just not squatting in a in a way which is really taxing the glutes or allowing the glutes to be involved in the lift. So there's a couple of things there for the squat and the deadlift. So that's the first thing I look at. Are we seeing your form reflect proper glute training? Now, if we can say no to that, like if you are not locking out your deadlifts, if you're a very quad dominant squatter and a, a range of other things, 
it means your body is adjusting to the fact that you you just your quad your glutes just aren't very strong. The first thing would be to do first thing to do then is not to add in extra glute work. The first thing is to fix your form. You know, fix your form. Um, I think would be the first thing. You know, so let's lock out the deadlifts. Let's make sure that when you're squatting, you're actually pulling your uh, knees apart at the bottom and you're squeezing off the floor. You know, you're not uh, you're not trying to come up on your toes. That's one thing. Correcting the form is the first thing. Okay. Then I'd say the final thing at that stage would be to then add in some additional work, which maybe focuses on the glutes a little bit more. Now, I'm not a massive fan of the glute bridge and hip extension type of stuff like that. Like I think properly performed deadlifts, um, sumo deadlifts, um, deficit deadlifts, Romanian deadlifts, um, these are all exercises which can really hammer the glutes and posterior and take a little bit of stress off the lower back, which can take a lot of strain uh, when deadlifting with glute weak glutes. So I would want to see maybe some smart addition of some exercises where the focus is really on form. So like, for example, start really like doing Romanian deadlifts. Probably, Bruno, if I'm right about you, then probably when you Romanian deadlift, there's probably quite a lot of back involved. So what I'd want to see with your Romanian deadlifts was really stretching the glutes back, trying to get them to stretch and then snapping forward. Maybe good mornings with similar kind of form. Again, maybe you're a very back dominant good morning person. So get the form right first. So you are really working the glutes. Maybe have a look at your sumo deadlift form. Perhaps your sumo deadlift form isn't that great. Perhaps you're a better uh, conventional deadlifter or perhaps you do like the sumo. But when you sumo deadlift, your form isn't very conducive towards working the glutes. Like maybe you're quite narrow. Maybe you're, you're quite bent over. It's not a traditional sumo where you're really low to the floor and pulling with your legs spread out wide. So, yeah, I mean, three, three things to focus on there. So this is quite a detailed answer, really. It's quite, a, de it's quite a, a complicated question. Firstly, do we know the glutes are a weakness? You know, is it just your insertions? Visually, you might just not have very big glutes. And there's not much you can do about that. You can build them up, sure, but you know, again, if they're small, if they're high insertions, they're always going to be proportionally smaller. Second thing is um, get the form right on the bigger base, big basic exercises. The big basics are basics for a reason, and everybody, when it comes to the big basics, will have different ways that they like to accomplish the lift. Like when I bench press, for example, my elbows are tucked. When another guy bench presses, because he's got a barrel chest and shorter arms, his elbows might be out here. I can't do that. I don't do that. I've got longer limbs, you know, um, and so when I bench, I have my elbows in tucked, and that feels good for me. So we're all going to have different interpretations of the basic exercises, but the first thing to do is make sure your basic exercises are at least covering everything you want them to cover. And um, yeah, for that, I mean, common ones are deadlifts, not locking them out, squats being very quad dominant. All of that is just going to take pressure away from your glutes, which over time is going to exacerbate the difference. So it's it's kind of like a it just, it's just a spiral, downward spiral. The glute weakness means you're, you don't train them as much in those lifts. You don't train them as much. They get weaker in comparison. So over time, it just gets worse and worse. So your form for the squat gets more and more quad dominant, more and more quad dominant. Your deadlifts get more and more back dominant, more and more back dominant. So that's the second thing, you know, get your lifts right. The third thing is, yeah, potentially adding some assistance exercises. I still always prefer like squats and deadlifts, like um, glute bridge machines. They're quite good sometimes. Um, women tend to like them. Um, they're okay as a higher up exercise as an assistance, but I think of a glute glute bridge as kind of on the same level as leg press. You know, it's not a squat basically. Um, the glute bridge, it's not a deadlift. It's an assistance exercise. It's an accessory. It's not a squat variation. It's not a deadlift variation. Um, it's on the same level as a good morning or a Romanian deadlift or a leg press or a leg extension. It's an accessory to the main lifts. So sure, it can be useful, but I would want to see you start off with a good variation first. That's going to give you more bang for your buck. You know? So let's say maybe introducing light sumo deadlifts with a focus on getting nice and low, your feet nice and wide. Uh, when I say low, I mean your hips nice and low, your feet nice and wide. That's the first one. And... Um, yeah, making sure when you're squatting, um, you are pull, you're pushing your knees out at the bottom, and you're you're using the glutes to finish the movement, and also you're locking out your deadlifts. You know, it's another one. 
a few things there before you know other things that we could we could uh, we could look at like specialization cycles anyway hopefully that was um a useful answer so next one this is from richard arias quintero another regular of the channel hey richard now richard's got a few questions about the upper lower program so the upper lower program is my barbarian program <laughs> almost forgot what it was called then. Barbarian program, so upper lower, he bought it and he wants to know a little bit about um, about some options for that. His first question is, can I use giant sets? So for example, can I superset bench with a row, squat with abs? Yes. A resounding yes. Antagonistic supersets, so there are two types of supersets, right? There's um, antagonistic supersets, which are supersets for opposing or at least different muscle groups. So maybe buys and tries, um, squats and abs, you know, stuff like that. But, you know, you could also do things like legs with shoulders, for example. People do that. Um, that's sort of antagonistic supersets. Agonistic supersets are where you do two for the same muscle group, and that's to place more stress on the muscle. So that's not what Rich is talking about. Rich is talking about antagonistic supersets. And they're usually used to save time. But, yeah, great. I mean, they're, they're good for two reasons. One, they save time. But, two, you can get more rest for the same muscle group. So for example, let's say I do um, bench press and superset with a row. And there's a minute rest between each exercise, okay? Or I do it, you know, every exercise on the minute. That means, although I'm resting one minute per exercise, I'm actually getting two minutes rest for the muscle group. So it's a lot more rest. You know, it's like a regular rest period, but it means you can condense your work in loads. So. I do it where I can, but the gym that I train at, it's not a home gym. It's a busy, relatively busy commercial gym. So I don't do that because you end up hogging a lot of equipment. And if I'm doing a big compound exercise, then I don't necessarily want to do that. It's different with cables and potentially you could superset, you know, a bench press with a dumbbell kill, for example, or a chin up with a tricep extension. Those are some decent supersets without, and you don't, you don't have to use too much equipment there. So uh, yeah, I, I support that idea. I think it's good. It's also good for conditioning. You get more working. It's good to be able to get fit in all your volume. It's good. But uh, I would say as well, if you are struggling with the volume on um, the Barbarian, remember there are three versions. Uh, the first version is just as good. You know, If you're making progress on the first version, which is a low volume version, great. Don't feel like you have to go up. Second thing, for every pattern, pull, push, hinge, and squat, you have primary and secondary exercise. The secondary exercises, can I ch change them every week for less monotony? Yes, you can. Well, I do this a lot. So um, I will have like a list of secondary exercises. Like I'll just tell you off the top of my head. Currently right now, my secondary exercises for um, hip hinge is good mornings, uh, Romanian deadlifts for high reps, and uh, glute ham raise, three. So basically, whenever I go in, I just alternate. It's good. And I just, I try and beat whatever I did last time for that exercise. It works great, you know. It's a really good way of keeping progress going, but also staying fresh. So, um, and you can do that for anything. So let's say, for example, your three main pressing exercises are um, the regular bench press, the incline press, and the feet up bench press, okay? And your three, like, assistants, exercises, secondary exercises for the pressing is um, overhead press, weighted dip, and dumbbell bench. Great. Just keep rotating them. No problem. You could even have more. You could have machine press if you've got a good one. Um, incline dumbbell bench is five. Just keep rotating them. So hit this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Keep going around, keep going around. Yeah, just try and beat your numbers. Uh, it means you're always progressing. Um, but you're not exposing yourself to the same movement patterns week in, week out. You might come around to a movement every 20 days, which is fine. You know, every 14 days, which is fine. Just as long as you go around and you, and you progress, it's enough. If you've gone, you know, 20 days without, with, without hitting that lift and you don't progress, well, that's a problem. But um, sure, you know, I just keep records on my phone and I just try and beat them every time. I've got an app that I use. Um, heavy set, and uh, I just try and yeah, just try and beat myself, beat the, the numbers that I got last time. Okay, so that's the second question. Uh, yeah, it, it works great. 
Now, third question is for conditioning. I usually do EMOM with bodyweight exercises like CrossFit. For example, pull-ups. When I count sets for a body part, do I have to account the pull-ups that I did for conditioning? No. No. It's a good question because um, I do that as well. So I do conditioning workouts every now and again. Um, like you guys know, I do some long distance running now. Not like massively long, but I do about an hour. But I also do a bunch of other stuff as well, just to stay active. I'll do shorter hit type workouts, sprint type workouts. And yeah, I, I don't count them with my weekly workload because when I do chins, I'm chinning with, you know, 20 to 40 kilos around my waist. So body weight chins, it's just conditioning. It's just exercise. It's just moving. It's not actually progressively loading my muscles. So um, I don't. Um, like if you're doing maximum sets of five to eight in your conditioning workouts, well, that's not, you know, it's not conditioning anymore. It is weights. But what you say is you're doing EMOMs. There's something you have to do consistently for 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. It's probably not challenging enough to be classed as weekly volume. I would not. I would, however, Richard, be careful about um, overuse injuries. So don't like tear a lat trying to do loads and loads of pull-ups because you did pull-ups two days before in the gym heavy. So just be careful. I don't do as many um, pull-ups in the my conditioning workouts as I used to. So just because I've learned, it usually leads to niggles and aches and pains. Push-ups are good. Mountain climbers, burpees, um, squats, like bodyweight squats, lunges. Um, pull Inverted rows are pretty good. But pull-ups, it's... It, they're a little bit too close to what I might do in the gym, especially if I'm doing high reps. I did this workout once, which was um, every minute on the minute for 30 minutes, I did uh, five pull-ups, uh, 10 push-ups, and 15 squats. So, I mean, that's just a ridiculous amount of everything. And um, I definitely felt like my lats were on the verge that of maybe hurting myself when it came to the next workout. So I, I thought, I'm not doing that again. It was fun to do, you know, but... You can overdo that, and it's not, it's just overuse injuries. So, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. All right. Next question is from Harsh Panwar. Hey, Harsh. Um, Harsh says, I'm thinking of building a strength program based on your five, 853 progression. Cool. That's good. It's a very good progression. Um, it works very well. Um, but should I make it 642s for the deadlift, as suggested by Stan Strength? Uh, also, how viable do you think this progression is for pull ups? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm a big fan of Stan Strength, uh, Car uh, Carell, uh, really nice guy, good good friend of mine. Um, I didn't realize that was his what he was doing, like six fours and twos. Um, my eight fives and threes goes back 12 years now, I think. It's when I did it for my powerlifting days. I didn't realize he sort of adapted that to six fours and twos. But that's fine. I mean, that's people people should adapt it. I wouldn't though. I would if I was going to adapt it in any way, I would go the other direction. Rather than go lower reps, I would actually go higher reps. I would go like 12s, 9s, and 6s. When I did that video on 8,000s and 3s, quite a few people in the audience, in the comments, sorry, said, uh, what about, you know, higher reps for hypertrophy? And I said, okay, if we're going to do that, use the same principles, but do 12s, 9s, and 6s. So that way you get that, you know, volume break as you go down. For me, that makes a lot more sense than doing 6s, 4s, and 2s. I think that's, you're getting, the range is too tight then. There's no point in dropping. I, I wouldn't. I don't think that would work as well. It's just it just wouldn't make as much sense. Go the other direction. And if I'm right, harsh, you're not exactly that advanced. Um, I think you're probably not at the point where it makes sense to do such low reps. I think you need to get the reps in. I mean, right up until I was uh, squatting four four and a half plates, I was doing sets of eight. You know. Um, with like 140, 150. I mean, you've got to get the reps and you've got to put the work in. Uh, I think far too many guys go towards lower reps way too soon. And all I see when they do that is they stagnate because they're just not getting enough reps in to build muscle. Like you need to, you need to get the reps in. That's how muscles, that's how muscle and strength is built. It's not built with six fours and twos. Sixes maybe, but twos. No, I would, I would go the other direction with that. I would go twelves, nines, and sixes, which is what I stated in the video. Um, follow up. So um, yeah, uh, yeah, I wouldn't do six fours and twos. How viable do you think progression is for pull ups? It's very viable. I'm doing it right now, <laughs> so it's very viable. Um, yeah, and again, 
not six fours and twos. I'm doing eight fives and threes. And I would also consider doing 12s, nines and sixes for pull-ups too. Um, you get a lot for that. You can just carry that going. You know, My advice to you, Harsh, is worry less about the program, okay? Worry about progression per exercise. Use the, use the eight fives and threes, okay? Or the 12, nine and six. Give yourself a selection of exercises. So for every area. So let's say, let's say for pulling, okay? You rotate between chin-ups, pull-ups, and maybe, I don't know, some kind of chest supported row um, or cable row, right? Three or four exercises, ensure you've got some kind of progression scheme and then just just get them in, okay? Whether it's in a week, whether it's in 10 days, whether it's in two weeks, just have a rotation and just focus on improving everything whenever the next time you do it. Routines are kind of overrated. This is why most most guys, like nat natural coaches, they're mostly defaulting to things like, you know, upper lower routines or a uh, full body because like it doesn't really matter. You just need to have a time efficient way of getting the lifts in. Doing the lifts over and over, making sure you've got a nice synergy between your all the lifts for that area, something which addresses your weak areas with your weak points, that's more important. Um, so don't worry too much about the the actual routine, like creating your own program. Just just get your lifts in and just do them on a push-pull leg, do them on a, on an upper-lower or do them on a full body. Anything other than that is you start to get a bit fancy and you start to wonder why is he doing it this way when pretty much every other good strength coach does it either full body or upper lower. It, it's because it makes the most sense. Just get your lifts in. Get about four variations per week, maybe six to eight variations across two weeks. Pick a range of exercises. Get better on those exercises. Make sure they're supporting your weak areas. That is the key, okay? And try not to go too low in reps if you're still a beginner to intermediate. It doesn't make any sense. All right. Okay, we'll probably end with this question because it's a good one. This one's from Three Days Grace. Uh, he says, thanks again for doing this. I have my engineering exam in three months. I want to get 99th plus percent percentile. I don't care about my gains for these next few months. Bad idea. <laughs> Joking. Just need some tips to stop procrastinating, increasing concentration. Right now, I'm able to study for 10 to 12 hours daily, but I need to get that up to achieve my goal. I have some very good tips for this. Firstly, I can almost guarantee you, you're not studying for 10, 12 hours daily. <laughs> All right. Now, here's my, folk, my, here's my tip, and this is why I say that. You need to start break, you need to start time blocking what you're doing. And it's very important because if you just, like, if you just have like, okay, I have all day to study, I guarantee you, you will procrastinate like hell. Well, you've said you do, right? So you're not studying for 10, 12 hours. You're, you there's a lot of procrastination. And the reason is, and this boils down to something very important, the time you allot, the, the task will expand to the time you have allotted to it. Okay, so if you've said today, I'm gonna study, I don't know, this part of engineering, you will take the entire 10, 12 hours to study that one area. You will, because you've not time blocked anything. You, there's no sense of urgency. I, 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 took, um, I took a few days off during Christmas, and part of that was creating a schedule for myself so that I was able to time block effectively. I did the same thing. Like I was, I was the same way. I, I'd feel like I was working all the time, right? I would feel like I was working all the time. And if anyone said, you, you know, you're not, like, I'd be, oh, terrible, feel terribly offended. But the fact is I wasn't. I was, I was trying to work all day, like 10, 12 hours. But because there was just so much to do and there was so much time to do it in, I ended up procrastinating. It would be check email here, check phone here, do this, interfere with that task, interfere with that task. What I do now is when I'm doing my client check-ins, occasionally I'll actually switch my internet off and I will do all the check-ins, okay, as I need to do them. And then I'll switch it back on, do my videos, send them back and forth, all that kind of stuff. When I'm working on an ebook, I will definitely switch the internet off because then I just have two or three hours where I could just go at it. And I say to myself, okay, I'm going to go at it solidly now for an hour. And then I'm going to get up, take a walk around the block, come back, work on it again. 
you need to start time blocking your efforts. And I guarantee you when you do that, you'll see far more productivity, but you'll also have more time to yourself so you can recharge your batteries. It's a little bit like training and, and deloads. <laughs> People say, look, I never take a deload. I always train like a beast. Bullshit. I see people like that in the gym who never take a deload. They train like, well, they don't train very intensely, okay? Because they're always trying to train hard. They never actually take a break to reload, recharge. So they're always knackered all the time. It's the same with trying to study 10, 12 hours a day. I can guarantee you, well, I mean, you've said you're not, you're not tr studying 12, 12 hours a day because you're knackered. You're mentally burnt out. What you need to do is time block your efforts. Say, okay, I'm going to wake up at this time. This time is what I'm going to be at my desk. Then I'm going to work for a solid block of two hours. Then I'm going to take a break for a cup of tea, maybe some breakfast. And then I'm going to work again for a solid two hours. Put it into a spreadsheet. Put it into a spreadsheet. Map out your day. Okay. Map out um, when you're going to be at your desk, when you're taking your first break, another block of work, when you're taking your lunch. Map out some time to go for a walk. Come back. So you have like maximum two hour blocks throughout your day where you're working and write down what you're going to do. So every night before you go to bed, write, fill out those blocks of time and specifically mention what you're going to do during that time. So I'm going to do this exam paper, I'm going to research this topic. I'm going to revise this, these notes for my teacher. I'm going to do another past paper here and I'm going to finish off doing this. Write it all down and then execute. I guarantee you, one, you'll be more productive. And two, you'll see how much time you actually waste doing nothing because you're just, you are just procrastinating so much because you don't actually have a plan. And every task that you say you're going to do, it just expands through the whole day. If you'll do a bit of work, check your phone, check your email, grab a cup of tea. Before you know it, half an hour has gone by and you're back at your desk. But it mentally feels like you've worked all day. It's, it's the biggest con. We con ourselves. It's the biggest con. We tell ourselves we're working all day. BS, we're not because we're not time blocking things effectively. We're not making the best use of our time. What, what happens is it becomes just a malaise of just constant lazy work, which just ends up being busy work. Stop that. Give yourself a block of time to work, okay? A reasonable block of time, like eight hours in the day, okay? And then once you're done, switch off, relax. But when you switch off, you switch off. And when you're on, you are on for that block of one or two hours solid. Literally, if you if you can, switch off the internet if it doesn't affect your work. If it does, keep it on. But switch off your emails, switch your phone off, put it upside down, whatever you need to do. Remove any distractions and go on it for that period of time. And then break. And when you do break, move away from the computer, go for a walk, go to the kitchen, do something else. Have separation. Otherwise, your entire day is going to be spent in front of the computer, procrastinating, doing nothing. Guarantee you that. So yeah, um, obviously, this is an area which applies to me a lot because as an entrepreneur, I guess, someone who owns his own business, you have to be sure that you're making best use of your time. Because if you don't, time very easily slips away. Like, I did a ton of writing during the Christmas period because of this. You know, I time blocked you know, for eBooks, time block for this, time block for various things. And I do that now and I'm far more productive doing that. I feel like, and I also, the other side of it is when I get to the end of the day and it's time to switch off, I do switch off because I'm confident and happy in the fact that I've actually put in a good day's work. Otherwise, you know, it just, you, there's a sense of nervousness because you've not ticked anything off on your list. You've just done work. You've not done much. So have a plan, plan it out. You can do it day by day. You can plan for the whole week if you want to. So you know this week I'm covering all of these topics in these particular time slots and then tick them off day by day so you get them done. So that means when you go to sleep at night, when it's time to relax at night, you can actually relax safe in the knowledge. You've done what you've done and it's part of the plan. So big tip, hopefully hopefully that you listen to that because when, the first time I heard it, I immediately got defensive. And I was like, no, that's not me. I work all day. What are you talking about? And I did. I hope that's not you. Take it on the chin. Okay, the, uh, it's, it's true for everyone that I know until they actually sort it out. Right, I'm going to call it there. We'll carry on with this in part two. All the best, folks. Speak to you 